All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for, for having me here. Super excited to talk to you on it. Actually, hear a lot more about your stories too and, and how you came to uh, appreciate graffiti and, and why you're here. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine starting on all this stuff in the 90s. Like, we'll get into that story, but um, that there would be academic conferences uh, about this kind of thing. So, um, to that point, I've been waiting for this for a long time. Um, when we were creating our crimes uh, in the 90s, uh, we were really just making it up. I was a technologist. Um, Susan Farrell, my partner, the one that actually started our crimes, was a um, uh, interface designer and a, uh, a usability expert. We were not, um, you know, archaeologists. We weren't librarians and all these things that that all of you uh, bring to the table. So um, we were trying to figure things out. This is a sketch from my notebook, um, a place I work called Funny Garbage. We'll talk about in a minute. Uh, from around 2000, and it's it's pretty similar to um, the ontology that that I found the Indigo team published um, and partners published, um, and uh, that that's actually what really got me excited. It's once I saw that I was like, oh, this is the stuff that I was kind of thinking about a long time ago, but um, didn't really have the. Uh, I, I, it was this was all new, and it was it was a little bit beyond my uh, sort of capabilities of, of using these types of things. So. To see uh, your all work and and um, get the experiences is just really exciting. So uh, this is really going to be a, a personal story um, of how I got interested in graffiti uh, through uh, some of the work we did and some of the benefits and repercussions, I guess, of it. Uh, it's a photo of myself and my partner uh, Sleep um, uh, planning a little session uh, back in our hometown uh, in the nineties. So um, why am I here? Uh, as it was explained, I was, uh, um, I was one half of Mark Rhymes uh, with Susan Farrell. And uh, I'm a graffiti artist. There's a little bit of my work. Uh, I've been a writer since the late 80s, uh, early 90s. And um, I'm a technologist also by trade. So as a profession, um, I lead technology teams on on a lot of digital products. This is, you know, B2B kind of stuff, B2C things. Um, Work at a place called Favorite Medium. It's a small uh, consultancy for software development. And um, I think, like a lot of people in the scene, in the graffiti scene, um, I kind of see myself halfway between one foot in each of these circles. So, a graffiti writer as well as a historian and enthusiast is the, the word I like to use. Um, and uh, and I really feel like there's sort of one foot in each, each side of that. Um, and in that in that vein, you know, like a lot of writers are historians. We're all interested in the history where where this all came from. Like guys from New York or Philadelphia or whatever. Um, and I'm going to treat today much like, um, you know, although many of our stories are getting documented in, in uh, books or online, uh, still would say most of the most of the storytelling happens person to person. Um, you know, last night I was with a bunch of writers. And, I was catching up all the way and been, that's all things that you can't find in the book or whatever. So today it's really about that sort of storytelling, uh, imagining this with black books and sort of talking about the stories that happened over the years. Um, a little bit of context as I was developing this talk, uh, I was listening to a podcast, Angel and Z. Um, if you haven't heard it, it's fantastic. It's two young writers who are kind of trying to figure out their place in, in graffiti and they're talking to a bunch of great folks. And, they were interviewing, interviewing a friend of mine, Steve, he writes Espo. Um, and he said, the main utility of graffiti is a declaration of existence, uh, which sits with me. And uh, you write to know yourself and you write so that everyone knows you, which um, just like these, when he said these things, I had to stop and rewind and listen to them again and write them down. Um, and I just, I really, I really feel like they apply both from my graffiti writer perspective as well as my sort of documentarian or, or um, you know, historian aspect, because I think you do sort of what you gravitate towards, what you're documenting or spend time on uh, is also a reflection of, of sort of yourself. And you sort of basically question some of the things that you've learned, you know, previous to uh, getting involved. So um, early influences, I grew up in Central California um, in Fresno, where there is a there's a lot of uh, mexican-american gangs uh, in particular 
So I saw a lot of gang graffiti, um, which uh, is really bold. It's and then the way people talked about it, sort of fearfully of like, oh, the gang is something to be fearful. I think left a really big impression on a lot of kid growing up. And so it, it was something kind of bigger than it really was even in some ways. And then so another thing that happened very early on, I was like when I was a teenager, um, kind of before I was really hardcore in graffiti, as I got to take a trip across the U.S., uh, a road trip, and um, two of the things we stopped at were Mount Rushmore, which is the, the big cliffs that um, the president's faces are carved into. And also, I remember this registered cliff, um, a place where uh, Oregon Trail settlers were, would come, come by here and carve their names and take tags. Um, you can see something from like 1872, and this really left a big impression on me. Of um, this early graffiti, I made my family go. Sorry, that <laughs> this summer to go look at it again last summer um, and take pictures. So that's wanted to see it again, sort of as a, as a you know, I guess a man at this point, <laughs> and uh, and just sort of experience it again. But something about that road trip really, really struck me. Um, you know, on one hand, we have um, you know Mount Rushmore, which is a national landmark. It's something we hear people take summer road trips to see this thing. It's really like a, a big uh, patriotic thing in the U.S. And then these um, historic uh, um, things that uh, landmarks that are also revered and documented and sort of set aside um, and, and um, you know, celebrated. While, um, and this is, you know, permanent markings on nature uh, compared to non-permanent markings on man-made services. And, you know, one is created by a largely powerless group of people, um, and while the other ones were created by colonizers. And um, at the time, it, it just really struck me of like, wow, this is this is really wild. And uh, it's something I, I still can't kind of get out of my head of today. That being said, I, you know, I still love this stuff, and I understand where it comes from, um, but it, it still sits kind of wrong with me in a lot of ways. So then uh, a little bit later in 1990, I moved to L.A. Um, to go to uh, to school at USC, University of Southern California, to study computer science. And um, I, I, I'm not, it wasn't my first choice. I don't exactly know why I chose it, but I think a lot of it had to do with the, the big hip hop culture that was there and established in, in Los Angeles. And one of the, the big things I remember um, there is on Melrose Avenue, which is a big spot, all the alleys are all painted. Uh, by CBS crew, there was a shop in the early '90s called the Hip Hop Shop, and it was run by Hex TGO, who's a, a wild style master still involved in the scene. And is really famous for um, some of his battles with uh, Slick. You may have heard of, also a pretty famous um, artist. And in the shop, there were um, there were always DJs DJing or b boys, you know, breaking and um, and there also were um, photo albums, and uh, I asked them to, if they had any photos of, of people looking at photo albums or anything. They don't have any of that stuff documented. But um, it was the first time that I was around someone that had a really massive photo collection. And being able to talk to these guys about these pieces and sort of hear from their, their mouths the stories of what had happened, um, when these were created, stuff that was gone, that was the first time I was like, oh, I should be taking photos. Like, this is important. This is, even if it's just me capturing the things I've seen, um, it's a, it's an important part of the culture. And, um, and, and so I did. And that's, that's when I really started taking photography seriously and sort of figuring it out. So then uh, I got, um, so I was at school in LA and um, I got access to the internet, which seems so ridiculous at this point to say that, but, um, but it was huge. <laughs> And I don't, even, I don't remember what this is, but it's very, you know, it was all terminal based. It wasn't, um, you know, rendering graphics or anything, a lot of ASCII text. Uh, early 90s, um, it really was hard to share photos or binary files in general. You could, but there were some machinations around that that were, that were tough. Um, and, uh, and so um, I started the, uh, I started the graffiti mailing list. Um, so it was just writers that I'd found on, um, a couple of use that sites, uh, all dot graffiti, uh, specifically and rec dot music dot hip hop. And we won't get into use that, but if you're, if you want to hear more about that time, we'll be happy to talk about it. Um, so I started this private email list 
Uh, and there were some pretty important people on there for me. Juice TC5 from New York was on there. Eros New Wave Crew, another New York um, legendary crew, I was represented. And it was a way for me to expand the network. Um, there's also a pretty prominent writers from Chicago and Boston. I don't, at that point, I don't think there were any European writers on the list, but I could be wrong about that. Um, uh, it was, you know, it was mainly US based at this point. And I would say there was about 40 or 50 of us on there altogether. This is around 1992. So um, a little bit before, before our kind of started. Um, something that we don't talk about that much. Um, so then uh, at this time, what was going on um, in the scene in the early 90s, um, where I said it was hard to trade photos online, but there were a lot of um, photo trading through the mail. And probably a lot of you heard about this, maybe participated in it. And um, and so I was trading a lot of photos at this time, uh, both through uh, the mailing list. I made a lot of contacts there. As well as back in those days, in the zines, in the back, there would be classified ads. So you could find pen pals that you could trade with. And, and to this day, I still uh, uh, am in contact with many of those folks um, that I traded photos with. And uh, this is some, these are some photos from, there's a show going on in San Francisco right now from um, Skills Magazine. They opened up their archives and um, and just, you know, showed a lot of the letters and things. And, these are for uh, some friends of mine that I met at that at that time. Uh, my friend Dash here uh, wrote, and and it's uh, you know it's sort of a it's a really important time I think in in the culture um, that's sort of lost because of the internet. So sort of there's a couple things I'm talking about. There's kind of sad about the, the internet. I guess that's letter writing in general, not just for for PD. Um, and then 1994. Um, Mosaic browser was created. All of a sudden, the web was the thing that was happening. So I think Mosaic, I think it was actually 93. Um, and Susan started working on um, art crimes as a as a um, master's uh, project at University of uh, Georgia Tech. And um, she worked on it for a while. She had photos from Prague and from Atlanta. And um, and she put it online and, and she says that I I reached out to her within hours of the site going live. At that point, there's less than 2,000 sites online. It's really small. It's almost all academia or government stuff in the U.S. Um, and uh, we joined up right immediately. I had photos. Um, I had access to, to ways of digitizing those photos, which, again, is not point at this point. But uh, it was hard to scan things. Like that You know, people didn't have scanners. Um, and so then from my perspective, you know, I was exciting. I was a, I was a computer nerd. Uh, as well as you know, out there writing graffiti in LA, and uh, I've been married to things that I that I love. So it was a, an instant. Oh yeah, I have to participate in this. Um, and it was yet another way to you know create more connections um, with the broader world. Obviously, the World Wide Web uh, <laughs> was a lot bigger. And you know, I think you know back to that quote from Steve, and I think it's it's worth you know sort of just acknowledging the ego side of it. I mean, famous part of it, right? Um, do some of these things to to capture that and um, gain some notoriety. That the graffiti writer part of me is not lost. Um, so as we were creating uh, art crimes, and we were working on it, and opportunities would come our way. Um, we always had these kind of two goals. We would always sort of run everything through to make sure um, they were fitting. And well, they weren't explicit, but they just like as I thought back about it, um, as I've been talking about the history of archives more recently, um, you know, the biggest thing was changing the discourse around graffiti and making it more acceptable. At this point, articles or anywhere in the mat in the media, it was all negative. There were no positive stories happening around graffiti. Um, I mean, if they were, it was very small. It'd be independent press in New York or something like that. Um, and then uh, we always try to give writers new opportunities. So that was that was a big um, part of our our sort of ethos and and goals around what we were doing, um, which we can kind of state it in a second. And um, and this is kind of again this this might be hard to understand, but at the time websites were all hard coded HTML. There was no database powering these things. Like it, it would, I mean, there were some, but for the most part, not at all. That was that was really advanced in 1994. So we had to pick, um, we had to sort of choose the way things would be represented in a very careful way. Um, 
we we mainly picked legal or legalish walls, tolerated areas. We didn't really publish throw-ups or tags or anything like that. And that was, um, I mean, a couple of things. One is just scanning photos took a long time. And we had to sort of choose what we were going to put out there. Um, editing photos and all that was, was very time consuming. So, um, you know, the, the sort of more colorful things that, again, back to changing dialogue would get prioritization. Um, the other thing, the, the database aspect, um, we chose to organize by geography. So cities or scenes would sort of have their own section. And that was kind of for two reasons. One is the, the database side, as well as um, people's photo collections tended to be in one city. Um, and so it's just a practical thing. People would send us their photos or scan them, and they'd always be from one area. And I think the other thing about that is um, seeing... Uh, when I said scenes, a city's graffiti culture was, was I think, more important than it is now in a lot of ways, um, in that styles were so localized at that point, because there, although there was photo trading happening and zines were kind of happening, still the most important thing was really in your scene, you know, whereas today it might be getting fame on Instagram or something like that. And I have to say, this is one of the things that I sort of am sad about, of being able to go to a, a city and really see its style and 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 have something completely different than you would see in another place. Um, that still exists in some ways, but not not how it used to. Um, we also um, very from the beginning, uh, you know, the web. It was all about linking to other sites and writers, and we tried to uh, promote that um, as much as we could and and share other people's work. Um, and the other thing that, that we had at the time, uh, it was a centralized real-time calendar of events that were happening all around. Um, I think in some in some ways that's been lost a little bit. It's been a little distributed in different places. And um, it was an important connection, um, you know, for us personally, as well as the, the whole community and, and the work. So um, very early on, you can see this just a few months later, a month later after I joined up, I was sitting in the computer lab at USC, which again, like, uh, this is going to sound ridiculous, but the PR person at USC was bringing people around, was bringing press around the computer lab because this was so cool. They, we had like Max with big colored monitors and all these things. And, um, and uh, I was working on our crimes. I had graffiti photos and, and the woman was like, what are you doing over here? And, um, and, and so she, uh, She's, she's like, well, you want to talk about this? People's, yeah, sure. You know, whatever. I had no idea what was happening, what this person would do, but she very quickly got us um, some press and Newsweek, which um, it's it's really funny to talk about these things in retrospect. How big magazines were at the time? Magazines were huge. This is like the biggest thing you could get. It's a is a piece in Newsweek magazine. Uh, they, I like how they they printed the uh, the browser there. Uh, in the in the photo because no one knew what this thing was um and it was it was really important this actually this this article led to a lot of my professional career in many ways um, it got me a job at the university uh they were like what, what are you doing here we need a website so i started working in the university um and it was also a uh, you know uh my name was associated with graffiti in a in a prominent national magazine and so i got to have an opportunity to talk about graffiti with my parents Totally avoided that conversation this whole time. So, um, and this is a good one as opposed to, you know, showing a, a arrest warrant or something like that. So, it is a pretty positive uh, spin on it. Um, this is for guessing. A little bit later, this book came out, Graffito. Um, and it was the first time my work was published in a, in a book. Um, and that was, it was really exciting. Super, it was great. Um, in all honesty, it wasn't my best work. The person I painted with him is definitely not his best work. He's a, a real famous guy now, and it's it's not great. Um, there's a ton of inaccuracies in this book. It um, there was no permission or asked or any sort of like you know do you want your stuff published? But still, I was excited. Um, it was it was, it was like a fantastic moment in my in my as a writer. Um, and, and it's no disrespect to Michael Walsh. The book is really interesting. It's cool. Um, but it's in, in sort of retrospect, it's not regarded as the best book in the world, but still a, a little more fame from it, right? So then this, this big thing happened in LA. Um, it was the summer of 96, actually. Uh, you couldn't avoid GK. Um, this guy over here on the left, uh, that's him appearing on a talk show, uh, before I got arrested, uh, in the nineties called Gabrielle. And, uh, 
his stuff was everywhere and this probably isn't going to mean anything to anyone but it was like chaka levels of uh bombing in la he was everywhere full sale pieces full color pieces on the freeways right in the middle really you know fame spots heavens the whole thing um and uh and he ended up being um he had, ended up getting caught and arrested actually in seattle and deported down to la and uh a hundred thousand dollar fine, which at the time was wild. It still is pretty wild, but at the time it was insane. And then uh, multiple felony counts. Uh, he got like he was six months or a year um, in jail, which uh, was which you know just wild. Um, and so I thought it was crazy enough that I thought I'd post something on all doc graffiti um, about this. And and there were some things about the case in general where the the um, the pirate patrol officer that, that made the arrest, he was interviewed in all the articles. It really sat with me wrong. And I said that the, the cop was really out for fame, just like GK was. Um, maybe I was a little young and a little, you know, shouldn't have said some of the stuff I said, but he shows up in my, um, in my work the next day at USC. Um, uh, Randy Campbell does. And, um, he just off of that that post, literally the next day, he shows up at USC and he talked. And my supervisor let me know that he was um, that he was trying to uh, get me fired um, for posting this thing. And um, and I was uh, I I can't even explain how scared I was. I mean, I was supporting myself for the first time. Uh, you know, this is my first real job. It was at the university, which is really prestigious you know for me to have this job was amazing i wasn't a graduate yet and um i was i was completely uh i was completely freaked out let me tell you honest. and um we had some connections my my wife did uh through her university to the aclu uh american civil, civil liberties union and the eff electronic frontier foundation knew us through our crimes and um and so i reached out to them and aclu you immediately had my back. We got some really great connections there. Um, and they said, let them know you're talking to the director of ACLU if they ever get in touch with you. And you should clear your house out tonight if you have any photos or anything in your house, like get rid of them because it's probably going to come back in your door. You okay. So I called one of my best friends up. And sadly, he still harasses me about this today. It was his birthday and I completely forgot it was his birthday. He thought he was, I was calling him to get drinks, you know, let's go out beers instead of like, hey, can I borrow your truck? We need to empty my apartment right now. <laughs> no. So he still, still hassles me about that. I'm scared at this point. This is, this is not, this is not great. I get called into this guy's office. This is um, the Dean of Admissions at the time at USC, Joe Allen, my like two or three bosses above me. Um, and, uh, and I really like Joe and, um, he calls me into his, into his office and he is really like, he's laying into me. He's like, what do you think? Why do you support this? This is the worst stuff. What makes you think you, your opinion is any better than the architect, architect that designed that retaining wall and the freeway? He's letting me have it. And Joe is, um, Joe's like a, you know, he's a father figure to me. He's like one of my first professional mentors. So this is like hitting me on a couple levels, not to mention the fact that I'm just scared for my job. And so, um, and he's really like, he's letting me have it. It's going on for a while. Um, and then he stops and he's like, look, Brett, um, look, uh, you know, he, he talked to Randy Campbell the next, the, the day before. And he's like, look, uh, in the sixties, I protested the Vietnam war and, and um, he, uh, was out there a lot and he was very active in the protests. And, um, and so the feds, uh, planted some evidence in his apartment. He ended up doing some time in prison because of it. And so he um, he he said, I'll never let the cops tell me what to do. And he, I don't worry, your job is safe. I, you know, I told him to get lost. I think he actually is quite a bit stronger language to him than that. Um, and I just thought I share this because he really, um, you know, Susan started art crimes at Georgia Tech, the academic, uh, you know, um, environment, which is really important to us and protected us. And then Again, um, being at USC in the academic environment just, I think, really saved us in a lot of ways. And uh, and I just bring that up, you know, here with you all as as um, it's been an important part of our our journey. Uh, and uh, I just really appreciate it. And Joe passed away a few years ago. And just, I, I still think of him a lot. It's uh, <laughs> helping me out quite a bit there. Um, 
So archives is booming, things are happening. I've got the I've got Joel and I'm the ACLU in my back, which is great. And um, I get an opportunity to move to New York. And um and uh which I did it really to be closer to, you know, the birth of graffiti and um the whole scene and uh just meet more people. That was really what it was about. And um uh, I was really fortunate um to Get a job in a place called Funny Garbage, um, which was founded by uh, Law New Wave Crew and Eros New Wave Crew. Uh, we're just great designers, and we did a lot of uh, commercial work as well as a lot of cultural work there, um, including uh, we designed the, so you might know, the Doggy book, um, Style Master General. Uh, so we worked on that there. We had a lot of like graffiti projects go through um, the shop that people might or might know, not know where we're involved in. Uh, it was great. There was all these writers coming through. I can still remember Zephyr and, and Donnie's brother, Michael, coming through and sharing all the photos. And uh, it was an amazing time. We'd go up to Blade's house all the time and, and hear stories from him and look at his photo collection and, and document a lot of that stuff. Um, there was also a connection to uh, that Black Book page there is a book from one of Chris's uh, law, um, his black books when he was at uh, Art and Design High School um, in New York, which um, if you haven't heard about Art and Design, it was, uh, it was where many, many of the of the sort of masters, uh, you know, writers from the early 80s, 70s and 80s went. Um, it was just a very, like, seminal place that I still am hearing Art and Design stories about. Um, to this day, and uh, it was a connection to that say, Pope Art and Design. There was a lot of things there, and we had a we had a wall on our roof that we were painting all the time, and so many, so many, uh, you know, famous famous guys came through there to paint that. It's a really big part of my life of at that time, and and really supported art films. So, um, I hang out one day, and uh, I was was helping uh, days put his work online, and he's he's two thousand three. He's like, hey. But I'm pretty sure this video game that just came out, they're using your photos. And uh, he's like, I bet if you play it for a while, you'll you'll find some of your stuff in there. Which, um, which uh, I was like, okay, I'll check it out. And um, and so sure enough, I played the game for about a week straight. Um, and uh, and I found the photos. There it was. There's a bunch of bands with the same photo, and it's so ridiculous because they, they <laughs> the way they they just took the photo right from our crimes. And um, you can still, see, it's hard to see there, but there's still the grass from the bottom of the photo. Like, and they didn't even Photoshop that out or like try to place it in a good way. It's like, well, that's clearly my photo. So, um, so uh, we ended up, you know, filing a lawsuit against them. Um, and uh, and I got the artist involved, uh, Rune from, uh, from Fresno. And, um, you know, it was, it was one of those tough times because at this point, um, it, the, it's it's again yeah, it's sort of hard to imagine this but but the web was some people didn't even really want their work on there like they'd be happy with it in one way but like distributing your work online was just like foreign notion and it was kind of strange and um i remember really kind of being upset about this the fact that like someone was using his work without his permission like how easy it was just to copy the jpeg um but uh yeah, it's it's sort of hard to imagine the way people republish photos and just share everything online at this point. But I felt like it was sort of worth mentioning for that aspect. And the fact of the matter is, they could have gotten permission very easily and paid us a lot less than a pay for this photo. Um, but we, yeah, we both settled. We settled uh, the case, and, and both of us got paid for it. But um, just a, just one of those like things that really left a bad taste uh, in in my mouth and, and with both of us, both of our parts at that point. So that. We'll skip a bunch of things. Uh, it kept it, doing things, but um, what am I up to now? Um, I still, it's funny, as I was doing this talk, my wife was like, you still love graffiti. You just want to look at it all the time. You want to show it to people. You want to talk about it. <laughs> and, um, and you want to be around people uh, that want to do those things too. So um, that's really what my work is it's sort of about uh, to this day. Um, I never get sick with I, I was, you know, my kid can tell you, uh, I was around just taking photos and stuff yesterday as we're walking around. I still just love it. I, I don't get sick of it. Um, and so I'm working uh, sort of under the guys of Spray Street now, um, where I've been posting a lot of photos to Instagram. And I'm working on a, um, I'm working on an app, a mobile app uh, for photo sharing um, that really uh, 
you know, Instagram became the hub for all this stuff. I think a lot of us know that or don't know that. Um, but I noticed last spring or last fall that people were really, most of had gone down quite a bit on Instagram. And uh, that was when Twitter was really starting to fall apart um, as a platform. It's like, well, you know, maybe it's maybe it's time to, to have our own platform for photo sharing. So I've been working on this and trying to ta tailor it a little bit to graffiti and street art, uh, sports landscape images, which is really missing on, on Instagram. Um, and I've got some classification things in there that'll that sort of, uh, you know, try to get people to um, self-classify uh, for later for like the research aspect or if you want to just look at one sort of thing. Um, and this is really in the early stages, uh, but I'm just having fun with it. Well, uh, it's another way to sort of connect with people and, and, and talk through things, uh, get people's stories. So I just noticed that uh, I was just, I just met this guy last night for the last, for the first time. Um, I even, didn't even talk to him about that. Um, and then another thing that I've been working on a little bit in the background of the developer for favorite medium um, is a classifier uh, using machine learning. Uh, and so uh, this just really sprung out of the fact that I was sitting there looking at all these um, prints that I have, you know, 20,000 prints or some crazy thing. And as I was scanning them uh, during the pandemic, I bought a high street scanner to just get them digitized. And um, I was sort of overwhelmed when I started thinking about like adding all this data and sort of classifying and getting it all figured out what they were and, and all that. Uh, and so uh, tried to write some, some tests around machine learning, different uh, setups. Uh, and the first test we did is around classification around tags, throw ups and master pieces, pieces uh, just to see how well it would, it would sort of perform or we could get things without a lot of effort. Uh, we tried a handful of different technologies, and and this is a little bit outside of my my technical uh, know how. I'm sure there's people on the show that know a lot more about this or could speak to it uh, in, in more detail. But uh, just to know, you know, I think this is something interesting. This is something I'd love to to share this stuff with you know, that's interested, and then um, collaborate on any of that. If, if people need training data or like that, I'd love to to play um, in that in that world. And I think it's something that could really help a lot of us out. I'm sure people are working on this a lot more that I am, um, but just wanted to share that. And, uh, and as part of that, you know, um, social media, machine learning, it's, it's great. Uh, but I think, you know, sort of taking the stories I shared in mind, like we gotta be careful <laughs> with what we're doing with this data and how we treat it and how we share it and what we do with it. Uh, and so I just asked everyone to, to sort of, you know, think about these things as they're, as they're doing the work. Um, and, and take some of those lessons that I shared with, with you all as, as sort of note of, of things to, to consider. Uh, but again, thank you. I really appreciate the time and uh, can't wait to talk more about all this stuff all you guys. Fantastic. Oh, really great to hear. Thanks a lot. Um, are there any questions for Brett? Yeah, yeah. Well, not really a question, just like an expression of admiration. It's oh. like when I started doing my research in 2000, basically your site was pretty much the one of the two that I could use for uh, for the general information. So, yeah, it kind of really saved my life. <laughs> you know, so I for, for being so active and I'm super happy that it still exists. Yeah. Cool. But on, on that note, yeah, yeah. Um, like, how do you find it now? Because like when you started, as you were saying, it was totally different cultural setup. It was totally different, like the magazines and uh, online was a little bit, this online archives were not as appreciated as magazines were told for, but nowadays, you know, looking back, that was maybe one of the most important things as it was done. But how does it function now? Because I'm guessing you have to change quite a lot of your mindset in order to survive in in social media environment. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one thing I guess it shows to this though, uh, archives is kind of it's archived and it's in a static space at this point. Um, so you're not adding to it. Um, I think you know in a bigger way. It's funny because I've actually started creating zines again. I started making them and and sharing them because uh, I think in some ways they're still more rewarding than the digital. Um, how would I, 
Boy, that's a tough question. Uh, I think you're right. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, Instagram, like, I I wouldn't start art crimes at this point again. Like, if we were starting it today, I wouldn't do it. I would just use social media. Like, I wouldn't bother probably. Um, from like a sharing photos perspective, um, that being said, like, there's reasons to start sites and start archives, which I'm doing. But like, from a pure like promotional standpoint, it's probably not. The web is probably past itself at this point, right? Like, it, it would be all social. So I think that's why I'm also trying to create the graffiti's first social media app as well. Um, something a little different. The thing that we didn't talk about either in here is I miss, um, I don't know if you use 12 ounce profit at all, the, the bulletin board system. It's like the biggest uh, chat board for graffiti in the early 2000s and um, through like 2010 or so. And I really miss that community also, the whole like BBS culture and all that. So. So I'm trying to figure out how to do through that the app as well and try to reintroduce some of that communication yeah. back into it. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, another yeah. question. Yeah. Like I couldn't resist uh introducing street art into my research yeah. because like it's so mixed and the artists are sometimes the same to mm -hmm. feeling street art. Yeah. So basically you you kept the profile uh dealing only with graffiti. Yeah. So how how is that possible? Yeah, I want to say, say more about that. What do you, uh, I mean, when, when art comes with active street art, wasn't even a thing. Like no one said street art. That's, that's fairly recent, right? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to put a date on it, but, um, uh, it was all kind of the same thing until all of a sudden we needed to have this label, I think to, um, to sort of, I, I don't want to like be the authority on this, but um, but I think street art the label was created specifically so that it can be used by people like um, developers, uh, you know, developing places like this for in the U.S. gentrification, or also for sales um, of art and fine art sort of situations, um, as well as like people not wanting to be associated with graffiti, like the the, the bad word. Uh, to me, it's all the same. Thing, like you're saying so um just from a, a timing perspective our friends kind of happen a little bit before the street art you know believe it or not. Uh, but yeah, hey, street art i think it's a form from from people's acceptance of graffiti as a as a fine art and um and I, it's it's only done positive as far as i'm concerned for the whole thing it's been great it's been a great change uh, in dialogue and all those other things fucking each the fits Know what you're after or not? Do you have other thoughts? <laughs> well, I'm going to let other <laughs> other questions. I'm around, so if something comes up, we can we can talk about it. Like, I still had a long go. Yeah, yeah. And then when you were uh, saying that you got the, this little bit of press coverage from not only you but let's say graffiti in the early nineties, yeah. you say it was all negative, negative, negative. Yeah. Was there ever a time that you thought? What am I doing here? Is that you were questioning the stuff you were doing? Um, no, not, I would, no, the, no, because uh, I always loved it. Like, I just, I, you know, when I went to New York, the, the stuff that I took pictures of was were tags in the inside of the train, right? Like the, you said, like the lowest form, not the outsides and the painted pieces and everything. It's just something I, I just always loved it. I don't even know how to explain that to the point where, you know, when you're young and you don't really think about the question or any of that stuff, it's just like, oh, this is what I want to, what I want to do. Um, I think later once, uh, there were a bunch of other police sort of folks that were hovering around our grounds when we started it, they were threatening us. And we knew they, we knew that they got on the mailing list at one point because they shared some things that were private there, um, in the press and that stuff kind of scared me. I started realizing like, oh, surveillance is really happening at this, um, but no, I mean, I still, I don't know. It felt like the right thing to do. And then in retrospect, um, you know, if something bad would have happened, it probably would have been a positive in the long run. A lot of the time it would have been, a, it would have been a real pain. But uh, it would have probably done more for for us than anything else. Yeah. I'll see our experience. So. I don't know. <laughs> Young and dumb, like this. Yeah. Then for it. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
Thanks. Anything else? Oh, it's just only behind in the neighborhood. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> you uh, yeah. uh, wow, that's really funny. Uh, I don't, I think, I can't even remember that story now. I'm going to have to follow up on that one. I don't remember what it was. But, you know, essentially, because right around that time, um, David Bowie, I think it was David Bowie, put out like a single or so, or like an EP that used the same name. And so there was some like, there's a little bit of conflict there, but we ended up hearing from his people, if I remember right, and it's like, no, no, it's cool. Um, I don't even remember. I don't even remember what the story was. I think it was just like the whole art, you know, art is not a crime kind of thing. That's, yeah. where came from. That's a good question. <laughs> to come back. <laughs> it's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it's about 30 years next year, which is just insane to think about. Yeah. And the lady that started everything with her, is she still in the, the scene? Or? She's not in the scene, but she's around. Um, and we're, you know, she we still talk about stuff all the time. Um, yeah, she's, she's still around. I mean, she, she became um, quite famous usability expert. She worked with uh, Jacob Nielsen, who is the, really the father of usability. Uh, Nielsen Norman Group, Don Norman, that's famous for bringing a lot of interfaces, uh, you know, working with Apple, um, you know, GUIs and stuff like that. Um, and so she has had a really sort of remarkable career in usability online uh, through all kinds of stuff. She's famous in that world, too. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, oh, no. oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm interested in the, the new project that you have, the yeah. uh, yeah. biggest infographs that you did you for. If you can you maybe elaborate a bit more on uh, who is it for and well, what is the, like, what is the insane? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it's just kind of, uh, you know, social media experience, but pull it out of all the noise of like Instagram or something like that, where you see all this other stuff and kind of advertising gets in the way. And it's both for artists um, as well as bands and anyone interested. So, um, we, you know, we've got some ways of people sharing their work sort of a little differently than you can on Instagram and sort of tailor the platform specifically for street art and graffiti. Yeah, you know, we've got some some like collectability kind of stuff in there. That sort of thing as well. It's very early. Um, we've got some, uh, you know, see the test lights to release it right now on iOS. Uh, hopefully it'll be in the app store in the next month. I'd say it's something like that. And then we will be on public. And I'd love to get feedback on it too. I'd sort of see what people might like. Uh, and, and one of the things too, like I was saying that the class fire bit, I didn't, I can show it to you. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to get people to, you know, to say what these pieces are so that later people, if you just want to look at throw ups or look at freight trains or look at subway trains or whatever it is, um, it's all sort of categorized that way from the beginning. Um, that's part of the thing. Yeah. Cool.